Hi and welcome to everybody that's joining us online. I'm really excited to spend this time with you. My name is Loren. Just to give you a little bit of a heads up, we're going to go into a time of worship now. And then after that, Abel will be bringing us the word. This is week number three of our Come As You Are series. And then with that being said, I want to give you a special welcome if this is your first time joining us. We're really excited and I really pray and trust that you would meet Jesus today right there where you are. So just before we dive into worship, let's pray together and thank God for the privilege to spend time together as a family. Jesus, thank you so much that we can be in your presence. And I come and pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in our hearts while we're listening to this message that you've invited us into a brand new home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in His blood. Jesus, the light of heaven, the friend forever, His kingdom come. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in His blood.
as the graveyard spring to life so we will sing and we will dance till the earth that goes the heavens sing his praise till we see the other side let us sleep in world awake there's a new day on the rise and the enemy shaking as the graveyard springs to light So let the sleeping world awaken There's a new day on the rise And the enemy is shaking As the graveyard springs to light So we will sing, we will dance So the earth that goes the heavens Sing His praise Till we see the other side Is in his blood Jesus a light of heaven friend forever his kingdom come Hello Dr. Eric Bloemfontein my name is Abel and I'm so privileged to be spending time with you in the Bible Now in this sermon today, we are going to be discussing a passage of scripture that I am pretty sure that you are curious about. A passage that you maybe heard about in the past and were wondering to yourself, you know, what is this all about? And so there's this passage in the passage in the Bible where Jesus says that he goes to prepare a mansion for us in heaven. Have you ever heard of someone referring to this idea of Jesus preparing a mansion for you in heaven? Now today we are going to be looking at that passage of scripture and I would love to explain to you what Jesus was actually speaking about when he said that. But first let me tell you a story or maybe just ask you to imagine for a moment that you landed on Mars and you were shipwrecked. You landed with some sort of a space shuttle uh, on a mission and by some accident everyone on the spaceship died and you were the only person that landed on Mars. Mars, uh, the oxygen percentage I think is about 1.5% if I remember correctly what I read on Google. On Earth, the oxygen percentage is about 20%. That's why we can breathe nicely. But on Mars, you would struggle to breathe. Like <gasps> and then you'll die. That's why you have to wear a spacesuit. And so we've seen these movies with these very nice spacesuits and you're walking around on Mars. and not only physically will you struggle because you don't have enough oxygen you will also start to struggle psychologically if you are alone stuck on a planet you will struggle psychologically being alone will eventually make you go crazy uh, in some way now not only you know socially psychologically and physically you will struggle why because you are not home you are not where you are supposed to be you feel out of place Now, to be honest, I think for many of us, we feel like that in this life, uh, and especially when it comes to our religion or our faith. As a Christian, I think that many of us, and you might feel like this, you, you feel out of place when it comes to your walk with God. You feel like it's hard work. Like you really try to be a good Christian, but <gasps> you struggle. It's it's a lot of pressure, and uh, I think quite simply. many of us feel out of place and we feel like we are far from home now sometimes and in this world we feel like we are not home yet like earth is not our final destination and we've heard the sermons about you know you're not home yet and there is truth to that but it's not all true you see for many of us the gospel the good news of jesus is quite simply a promise that one day things will get better that's for many of us that that is the, the 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 summary or the sum total of what the gospel is is that what jesus has done for us 
has given us a promise that after this life, we will finally go back home. And then we'll be able to breathe properly and things will be as it should be. And that's actually just a religious thought. All religions thrive on this idea of delay and distance. You know, if you do these things, then maybe one day in future you can experience God. And for many of us, that's also what the gospel is all, all about. Now, what if I told you that that is actually not what the gospel teaches? What if that thinking of, you know, we're not home yet, we just need to, you know, believe in Jesus and then maybe one day he's got a ticket to heaven for us where we can finally breathe and finally get home. But right now we are stuck on Mars or on this foreign planet. We're not home yet. What if all of that has more to do with maybe the religious system in which you were brought up, even if it was inside of the church? What if that is not really what Jesus taught at all? I want to challenge some of those ideas in the sermon today. You see, I believe that what Jesus actually taught us is sometimes a little bit different to maybe what we've been taught in church. But what Jesus taught us is it's, it's that we are already home. Is that, that the, the finished work of Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection, and when Jesus uh, shouted on the cross, Tetelestai, he said, it is finished. What he meant by that is that we are no longer in the space of waiting for something. He has already accomplished something for us. And so God is no longer far, and God is no longer only in the future, that maybe one day I can experience God when I go to heaven. Is that we can experience some of heaven on earth right now. When Jesus comes, he is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. He sends his Holy Spirit. He says, it is another helper to come and make his home inside of us. My friends, best way to explain this, it's as if we have already been brought back home from Mars. We were stuck on Mars, but Jesus has already brought us back to earth and there's enough oxygen, but we are still wearing a space suit. It's, uh, for many of us, we have been set free, but we don't live free. We are already taken back, you know, to planet Earth, enough oxygen, enough friends to make. But because we're wearing a spacesuit, we don't realize there's enough oxygen to breathe. And we also don't have any friends because no one wants to be friend with someone wearing a spacesuit. <laughs> That's just a joke. But the point is that Jesus already made us free, but we sometimes don't step into that freedom. You see, the finished work of Jesus meant that you can have an intimate relationship with God. Having an intimate relationship with God, it, it's, it's like uh, it's coming home, is that God is our home. And Jesus has brought us back to the heart of the Father. We are home now. But we don't live like that often because we think it's only for special Christians. It's only for big Christians. Die groot christene. It's only for those that are really, really spiritual Friends, that is rubbish. It is for anyone that is in Christ Jesus. They are brought back home. And the conditions of God has been restored in the person of Jesus. The conditions of, you know, there's enough oxygen for you to breathe in the presence of God. And that is what the gospel actually teaches. And that's something I want to maybe show you. So, you know, Jesus, just thinking about the person of Jesus, he was so different. I mean, everyone that writes about Jesus, they, they witness that, that he was different. When he spoke, it's as if he spoke with a different kind of authority. When he engaged with, with challenges, uh, he wasn't intimidated because he knew what his authority was. When, when he spoke with people, when he engaged with people, Jesus was never intimidated. He wasn't intimidated by their, their status or success, but also he wasn't intimidated by their sinfulness. He never, you know, just wrote someone off because they were sinful. He was never intimidated like that. He engaged with people. And if you look at this life of Jesus, it was this perfect life of Jesus that we look at. And if you ask the question, why was it possible for him to live this different kind of life? Do you know why it was possible for Jesus to live this, this, this kind of life that, that looked like there's an open heaven above Jesus? Why was it possible for him to live an open heaven kind of life? Because heaven was open above him. It was because Jesus had an intimate relationship with the Father. Jesus knew that he was the son of the Father. And because of this intimate relationship with the Father, it was possible for him 
to act differently, to speak differently, and to love differently. And so for many of us, we think that if we do A, B, and C, and if you, if we think that the Bible is a, is a book of do's and don'ts, and if I do all of these wonderful things, you know, it's all about my action, then I'll be a better person. Whereas the reality is that if you live closer to God in an intimate relationship, if you walk with God daily, you will be different. And that is what Jesus has done. He has canceled the distance between us and him. Now, in the beginning, uh, John observes this person of Jesus. And he looks at Jesus and he says in John chapter 1, verse 4, In him was life. There's this different kind of life in the person of Jesus. And this life was the light of men. And so he's speaking about this life of Jesus. But then later when Jesus speaks about this life that he is living, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he starts including us. He includes you. And he says that I have come that you might have life. Not that only one day you get to go home, but right now that you can have life and have it abundantly. Jesus comes to open the way for you that you can step into the same kind of life that he had because of his intimacy with the Father, you can also access. And then verse seven, oh, John chapter 17, verse 3, and he, uh, Jesus says, And this is eternal life. This is what this life is all about, is that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And what Jesus is saying, what this life is all about is not about a book of do's and don'ts. This life is about knowing God. It's about knowing God. And the original uh, language actually explains to us that this knowing speaks about experiencing God. What would your life look like if you walked with God daily? What would it look like for you if you actually knew God experientially? If, if you experience the presence of God, friend, your life will look a lot more like Jesus because that's what he had access to. He had access to the Father. And that is what Jesus does. He says, not only do I live this life, but I come to bring this life to you so that you can have this access. So before we maybe just read uh, that, that passage of Scripture that I promised we will quickly read about, about Jesus preparing a mansion for you and what did Jesus mean by that, uh, before we read that, let me just quickly uh, use another example. Uh, many years ago, I had the wonderful privilege of going overseas, and I found myself in America in New York City. What an amazing city. And I was there for two weeks. There's so much to see, so much to do. But I remember it wasn't all that because my wife wasn't with me. At that stage, I was already married, and I missed my wife so much because I want to share these experiences with her. And I would trade New York for my wife. In week one, it was amazing. Week two, I just wanted to get back home. But my wife and I, we still had contact. We sent each other text messages. We could even, you know, phone each other. We didn't have like proper video call like we have today. Or we could Skype a little bit. And we could, you know, sometimes see each other on a screen and speak to each other on the phone. But I wasn't home. It was still distance. She was on the other side of the planet. And still, it was, you know, seven more days, then I'll be able to be home. Then everything will be as it should be. For many of us, that's what our Christianity looks like. Our Christianity looks like God is still very far off, and we are still here. And maybe one day, I'll be able to be close to God. You know, if I'm a really good person, or if I believe this Jesus thing, then maybe one day, He will transfer me, and I'll be close to, to God. And friends, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that you are already home because that was the, the, the finished work of Jesus is that you are already home. For many of us, it's like maybe just using another uh, example. And now just, just to say this, that this is what religion thrives on. It's always been the case with religion. This is the kind of religion that Jesus actually stopped. Is the kind of religion where God is very far and very distant and there's a delay. Religion thrives on distance and on delay. What is the gospel that you grew up with? What, what, just if you, if you were to put your, your mindset of the gospel on the table, is it a gospel of distance and delay? That God is still far off. He's too holy. I cannot approach him. I can never be good enough for him. And it's only one day that I'll experience him. Or is it a gospel that it is finished? 
tetelestai, that the finished, we believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. Obviously, there are certain elements about it, the experiencing God that we will only one day experience in its fullness. But friends, heaven has already been opened for you and me because God has come close. That is the message of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, he has come close. Now, I think the way that many of us live, it's like uh, my wife and I, when we got married, what a day. I remember the day, such a brilliant uh, or such a memorable day for me, special day. But that would be like me, the way that we do Christianity today is like we get married and then we say, okay, goodbye, Karin. It was really nice getting married to you. I will remember this day for the rest of my life. And then we never see each other. You know, that is sometimes the way we approach God. It's like, thank you that you have saved me, that you've forgiven my sins. I'm really looking forward to one day seeing you in heaven again. Friend, the best part about getting married is living together. It's moving in. It's moving the furniture into one house and living together, being with one another for the rest of our lives. And there would be fruit from this marriage, children coming. That is what you have been invited into with God. But sometimes we settle for the forgiveness of sins that one day we can go to heaven just for that. But we don't step into the freedom and to into our new home, being with God. So let's read that passage quite uh, uh, quickly. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Um, it says, Jesus speaking to his disciples. Now, Jesus has been communicating to his disciples that he will be leaving them. John chapter 12, he says that the Son of Man must be lifted up. And they ask, but why? You know, and he, sp- he tells them that the Son of Man will suffer and they don't understand what's happening. And in John chapter 13, he washes the disciples' feet and he explains to them that he has to come to serve them. And he's referring to the cross. And then in, the, in light of this is the Thursday evening. You know what happens on the Friday? He gets arrested and he goes to the cross. You know what happens on the Sunday? He's raised from the dead. Then he ascended, uh, ascended uh, you know, to the Father and he sends the Holy Spirit. That's what happens after this. But on that Thursday, just before this happens, this is John chapter 14. And Jesus speaking to his disciples, trying to explain to them why he has to go to the cross and do his work. Because they don't understand. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, you know, Jesus uses these metaphors. He says that I am the door. Is Jesus literally a door? No, no. But he is the access to God, the Father. He says, I am living water. Is he physically water? No, but yes, he is living water. And Jesus is speaking about the Father's house, right? And he says, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And some translations translate it as mansions. A better translation, and the one that I, I also read, says, in my Father's house are many rooms, okay? Because the mansions really got people very, very excited. But in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go, this is what Jesus says, why I have to leave you. Disciples want to know, why are you leaving us? He's saying, let me explain to you why I am leaving you. I have to go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know. So you say, you know the place that I'm going. So there's this place that I'm going. You know where I'm going. And the way, you know also. You know how to get there. And then one of his disciples You know, he's asking the Lord, how how can we know, you know, where you are going and how do we know how to get there? And uh, so Thomas was saying this and Jesus says, okay, you still don't get it. He says, I am the way to get there. I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so basically what Jesus is proclaiming is he is saying, the Father is the place and I am the way. So where is Jesus preparing a place, a room for you? It is in the Father. It is in the Father's presence, in the Father's house, in the, in the heart of the Father. There is a room for you prepared. That is the work that Jesus has come to do. And the way that you get to the Father, the presence to live in the Father's house is through the person of Jesus. He is the door. And so what Jesus is basically saying, this life that I have, with this intimacy with my Father in heaven, 
is open for you. That is the work that I have come to do. I'm leaving you now because I'm going to the cross and he goes to the cross the next day. He gets raised from the dead. He ascended on high and he sends his Holy Spirit. And in that work of Jesus, a place is prepared for you. And so the question quite simply is when Jesus speaks about preparing a place for us or these mansions, is Jesus busy with a building project today, building your mansion for you in heaven? Is it future tense or is it past tense? For the disciples, it was future tense because the next day he went to the cross and he starts preparing the room for them. For you and me, 2,000 years later, Jesus preparing a mansion for you is past tense. Friends, he has already done it. He has already prepared the home and he has brought you back from Mars, back home, so that you can breathe again. <sighs> it is possible for you to breathe in God and walk with God in this life right now because of the finished work of Jesus, not because you're a good person or very spiritual, but because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. Now in the rest of this passage, his disciples, and you're welcome to go read the whole of John chapter 14 and seeing this metaphor of a home being repeated by Jesus. His disciples are still very confused and he, you know, he explains to them that, that he and the Father are one and they say, but they want to see the Father. And he says, listen, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father because the Father is in me and I am in the Father and you will see when I send my Holy Spirit that I am also in in you. And so he speaks about the unity of him and the Father being opened up for you and me so that we can be part of the unity of the Trinity, that we find our home in him. And so I want to read you those last uh, a few um, scriptures. John 14, uh, let's maybe read from, John, uh, from, from uh, verse 16. And I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells, where does he dwell? One day in the future, far away from you because you're not a good enough Christian. No, no, no. He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is the message of the gospel. God comes to us. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. This life with an open heaven, you can have access to that. At, and then verse 20, at that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. And then verse 23, Jesus also gives this answer and he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. When Jesus speaks about coming home and there's a room for you in this home, he's speaking about the presence of God. Friend, in this series, we are speaking about that we get to come as you are and we're asking this question, what would it look like for you if you knew God, if you knew God? We spoke about it last week that you already have access because of a changed identity in the person of Jesus, his finished work on the cross and in the resurrection. And he has sent his Holy Spirit. God has already come close. We have already been set free. We just need to start taking off our spacesuit and breathe in God. It's religion that taught you to live in guilt and in shame. It wasn't God. It wasn't Jesus. Jesus came to set you free from all the guilt and the shame because he paid for it. He died for it on the cross and it's been taken care of so that now you have got a place with God. You have got a place with the Father. You've already been set free. Just start living free. Friend, I want to encourage you to read the Bible and to take off the space suit. There's no more distance between you and God. There's no more delay. You can start experiencing the presence of God right now not because you're good enough because of the finished work of jesus there is a room for you in the father's house just start stepping into it i'm going to pray for you and i pray that the holy spirit will give you this conviction and that you will start stepping into this liberty and start walking with god knowing that god is with us god is with us emmanuel god is with us and he has come to make his home inside of us with the holy spirit jesus thank you for this good news this is not a message of distance and delay and only one day. God, we do 
you know, look forward to, to that day of where we will be raised in, in incorruptibility, like where, where there will be no corruption. Where, where, ah, oh, sorry. This is a fancy word, but not unwa- what unwarag is. Means we will be right. As I can see, we are going to bed for us. It's a drag. Okay. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you for, for this good news. Uh, thank you that, that we know we've got access to you right now. And I want to pray for anyone that is watching this at this moment that realize that they are still walking on this planet with, with a spacesuit on. That they would stop and breathe you in. That they would realize that you have done enough to set them free, that they could live free in an intimate relationship with you. That is our desire, God, to walk closely with you. And thank you that you have done enough and that you have come close. I ask that you would bring this conviction home to anyone that is listening to this. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you and enjoy the presence of God. Well, guys, we have come to the end of our time together. And just two little things from my side. Firstly, if you've not connected with any of our on-site spaces, please take note of that. We have a campus right here in Bloemfontein in Central, as well as in Fichat Park. And we'd love to have you around. We keep it safe and we're so excited to always receive new visitors. And then last but definitely not least, if this is your first time and you'd maybe like to find out more about this family and join us, you can click on the link below and we'd love to connect with you at our Starting Point Connection Space. See you guys all next week. I appreciate the most of her is, is uh, I fell in love with the eyes. The one thing I appreciate most about her is actually her big heart. She puts everyone before her, always thinks of what other people might need before her own needs. I um, initially fell in love with how he looked and uh, I was completely head over heels and I still am today. And um, he's my best friend. What I like the most about her is that, you know, she is the creator of the family. She's a loving person, full of humor and humility. No, just say 14 December 19. See, that's why you always listen to your wife. Without a doubt, marriage is one of life's most exciting adventures. And the greatest thing is that we make this discovery together. together. But staying in step with one another is hard enough without the daily challenges that life throws at us. Join us for an unforgettable and life-changing weekend with Alan and Ivy Sutton. The Rhythm of Us. And if your life is currently filled with the joy of parenthood 24-7, our kids' ministry team will gladly take care of your 4 to 13-year-old adventurers. So make sure to register them too. The believer's baptism is a step of obedience and a public confession of faith in Jesus Christ. If you would like to be baptized, please visit our website to register online. All you community groups, listen up. All you discovery groups, listen up. All you radiance groups, listen up. And everyone else, listen up. On Saturday the 5th of March, it is game time. Our next first be social will be a group tournament and we are inviting all our small groups to dress up and show up. Your team needs to be 10 players, evenly spread between ladies and gents. Not in a small group yet? Don't worry, we've got you covered and we'll connect you to a team. Join us for an action-packed day filled with frisbee fun, good coffee, pancakes and prize to be won. Register your team online now. Boom! Marandikweta Miningam Chirwanga why am I here? Six, 
What's up with that? Why wait for marriage? Join us for this year-long discipleship journey where we will tackle questions on purpose, identity, relationships, and how to navigate this crazy upside-down world as a man or woman of God. In Matthew 21 verse 21, Jesus calls us to a mountain-moving faith, a faith that brings lasting change in our lives, our hearts, and in our finances. If this mustard seed faith can move mountains, imagine what a life completely rooted in faith in Christ could do. In this series, we are looking at three very important aspects to ensure that we steward these well and in so doing, make the kind of impact that contributes to our world. Join us for this exciting and life-transforming series. It seems today that all you see is violence in movies and sex on TV. But where are those good old fashioned values in which we used to rely? Did you know that anime dies? Dude! Spoiler! Ah, oh, come on. Three, two, one. Yeah!